Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, dear participants, I'm Alexandre Daillet, the Secretary General of the Foundation for Strategic Research here in Paris, and it is my pleasure to welcome you to this uh, virtual side event on the current state of ballistic missile proliferation. It's a session that is streamed live and which is being recorded as well. As many of you, if not most of you already know, we at FRS are funded by a grant from the European Union to conduct uh, research and debate activities on the Hague Code of Conduct against Ballistic Missile Proliferation, the HCOC. At this time of year, we usually hold an event in New York on the margins of the first committee of the UN General Assembly. In this instance, it will be a, a virtual event. Obviously, the coronavirus pandemic and the impossibility to travel have led us to try to creatively reinvent our working methods. And since we have not been able to travel around the world as we used to, to meet officials and academics and to hold debates and discussions at the national and regional levels on the HCOC and on related topics. We have also, over the past few months, dedicated some efforts towards writing and publishing research papers and issue briefs with more uh, papers to come in the next few months. Let me briefly say that uh, 2020 has seen the subscription to the HCOC by three states, Equatorial Guinea, Somalia, and St. Vincent and the Grenadines, following Togo in 2019. And uh, let me also add that this multilateral, politically binding instrument is a modest but rather effective tool in a global non-proliferation architecture that appears to be marked by the breaking down of several of its key components. Let us also consider the growing unpredictability and complexity of the international system, the changing power balance and technological dynamics, as well as the brutal disruptions caused by a global crisis such as the one we have been experiencing. It is true that today's topic, the state of ballistic proliferation, is a very broad ranging subject, which is uh, why we will have uh, quite focused presentations to remind us that the debate on ballistic proliferation should always be linked to concrete realities in the field and that ballistic missiles are being used in armed conflict. I would like at this stage to thank the European Union and particularly Ambassador Marjolein van Velen, Special Envoy for Non-Proliferation and Disarmament at the European External Action Service. We are very grateful for the continued support of the EU, especially during these trying times. Then we will hear from Ambassador Benno Lagner of the Swiss Confederation, resident representative to the IAEA and permanent representative to the CTBTO PREPCOM and current chair of the HCOC. After the welcoming remarks, we will hear from our panelists, Shan Sheikh and Ian Williams from the Missile Defense Project at CSIS, who will focus their presentation on missile proliferation and non-state actors in the case of Yemen, followed by our uh, two discussants, Dr. Sidki Egili, Assistant Professor of Political Science and International Relations at the Izmir University of Economics, and Dr. Titi Erastu, Senior Researcher at CIPRI. And uh, this uh, second part will be moderated by Melissa Hanhan, Deputy Director of the Open Nuclear Network and Director of the Datayo Project. So without further ado, I now yield the floor to Ambassador Magdalene van Leyden. Ambassador, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Oudoye, um, for that uh, introduction. And let me extend a wholehearted welcome to all of you. And thank you for your participation in this online side event on the Hague Code of Conduct. 
It's a great pleasure and privilege for me to be here today and to deliver these opening remarks on behalf of the European Union. The proliferation of ballistics, ballistic missiles, especially those capable of delivering weapons of mass destruction and space launch technologies, continue to be a serious cause of concern to all of us and to international peace and security, as reaffirmed in several UN Security Council resolutions. More and more states possess or seek to acquire technologies to produce ballistic missiles, while modern mi missile programs are mostly aiming at reaching longer ranges, greater accuracy and enhanced striking power. As a consequence, several regions in the world are engaged in a new arms race. This creates significant security risks for all and new geopolitical pressures, which is dangerously destabilizing. Unfortunately, so far, there has been no legally binding treaty or agreement aiming at stopping or curbing missile proliferation. We therefore must uphold and strengthen the existing confidence building measures. And this is the reason why the European Union strongly supports the Hague Code of Conduct. It's one of the very few existing multilateral instruments in the field of ballistic missile proliferation and the only one with the ambition of reaching, reaching universalization. By subscribing to the H Code of Conduct, even states not possessing missile capabilities can demonstrate their commitment to non-proliferation. As you may know, so far 143 countries have subscribed to the code. We are also particularly pleased to highlight that in 2018, uh, then at the UN General Assembly, the biannual resolution on HCOC was supported by 171 countries, which is a new positive record in comparison to the 166 positive votes in 2016. This is no small achievement, but we do hope to reach an even better record with this year's ANGA resolution on the HCOC. We therefore call upon all UN member states which have not yet subscribed to the code to demonstrate their active commitment in regulating the area of ballistic missiles capable of carrying weapons of mass destruction by voting in favor of this year's UNGA resolution on the Hague Code of Conduct. All EU member states have subscribed to the Code of Conduct, Hague Code of Conduct and the European Union consistently supports three key aspects, namely universalization, implementation, and improved functioning of the code. In this framework, we have consistently supported HCOC with diplomatic and financial support, and the current activities of FRS are part of that. So here I want to thank FRS for its energetic implementation, and I very much recommend uh, the papers, the research papers and the information briefs that you already mentioned just before. Some of them have already come out and there are more to come. I also appreciate the outreach and the marches done by EU delegations worldwide, mostly joined by EU member states. We need to all join forces in this respect. Last but not least, we are particularly pleased to have organized this online side event. Let me again um, give sincere acknowledgements to F uh, FRS for the excellent cooperation and for organizing this seminar. Again, many thanks to all for being present here today, and I am looking forward to the presentations and an interesting exchange of views. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Ambassador Van Thelen. I now yield the floor to Ambassador Lagner, the HCOC Chair. Ambassador. Thank you, Alexandre. Um, excellencies, colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, let me start first by thanking the Fondation pour la Recherche Stratégique for organizing today's event, and also for this uh, creative virtual format, which actually allows probably more people to participate in the event than if we had it in person in New York on the margins of the first committee. And I would also like to voice my appreciation for the strong support that the European Union is giving to HCOC. I have the honor of currently chairing the HCOC I would like to clarify at the outset that I'm not speaking on behalf of the code or its subscribing states, but that I am making my remarks in a national capacity. 
Switzerland has been a subscribing state to the code since the very beginning in 2002. We are committed to supporting global efforts to enhance international peace and security. And we are ready to assume our responsibility in this regard. Our chairmanship of the code is an expression of this. Ballistic missile activities and their destabilizing effects are increasingly becoming a major security concern, both at the global and regional level. We face an increase in the numbers, the geographic spread and sophistication of ballistic missile systems, and we are confronted by new risks stemming from new technologies and new actors. There are three main international instruments that each address aspects of the proliferation of ballistic missiles and complement each other. The Hague Code of Conduct, the Missile Technology Control Regime and UN Security Council Resolution 1540. The main objective of the code is to promote transparency and thus to build confidence. As has already been mentioned, today 143 states have subscribed to the code from all over the globe. But there are regions where considerable gaps in membership remain, namely in the Middle East, which is a focus of today's event and where a significant missile arms race is underway. It is often said that the code is a modest instrument. That is true. It contains a political commitment to implement certain general as well as confidence building and transparency measures. But on the other hand, in the absence of any legally binding norms in this area, the code fills an important gap and is the most significant existing multilateral instrument to address the destabilizing effects of ballistic missile proliferation. The code does not prohibit ballistic missile possession, nor the development of ballistic missile programs, but it calls for maximum possible restraint and focuses on responsible missile related behavior. I also want to underline that the code does not constrain the development of space programs. This is stated clearly in the text of the code, which explicitly recognizes that subscribing states should benefit from the peaceful uses of space. The scope of the code covers ballistic missiles capable of delivering weapons of mass destruction. The transparency measures also concern space launch vehicles. At the core of the code are the following transparency measures. First, subscribing states agree to submit annual declarations outlining their policies in this area, as well as reporting on ballistic missile and space launch vehicle launches during the preceding year. Those subscribing states that don't have any such programs can submit a simplified annual declaration. Second, subscribing states agree to exchange pre-launch notifications regarding their ballistic missile and space launch vehicle launches and test flights. This information reduces the risks of misperception by making sure that scientific launches are not mistaken for an aggression against another state. And third, subscribing states agree to consider on a voluntary basis inviting observers to their land test launch sites. The code is facing a number of challenges. These include further universalization. There are a number of significant missile possessing countries in the Middle East and in Asia that have not yet subscribed to the code. These regions will be the focus for Switzerland's outreach activities during our chairmanship. A second challenge is enhancing implementation. Not all subscribing states submit their annual declarations. And then there is also the issue of the limited scope of the code. It does not include, for instance, cruise missiles, which are becoming increasingly more important. Switzerland's priorities will address both the universalization issue as well as trying to enhance the implementation of the code's provisions. Another focus is to increase the visibility of the code. An important tool in this regard 
is the UN General Assembly resolution that has already been mentioned by Ambassador Van Dalen. The so far eight UNGA resolutions since 2004 have seen an increasing level of support among the wider UN membership. And I would like to take this opportunity to echo the call made by Ambassador Van Dalen on all member states to support this year's resolution, which again will be voted on shortly in the first committee. And for those countries that have not yet subscribed to the code to consider doing so. The code makes an important contribution to both regional and international peace and security. This is even more important in the current international environment where we witness an erosion of the arms control, disarmament and non-proliferation architecture. Thank you. And I also look forward to interesting presentations and an interesting discussion. Many thanks, uh, Ambassador Lagner, and it's now uh, time after these welcoming remarks uh, for our panel on the state of uh, ballistic missile proliferation. So I will hand it now to Melissa. Thank you very much to FIS and also to the distinguished panels for joining us not once but twice today. I think it's very generous to include all the time zones. And I'm very pleased to uh, introduce Mr. Ian Williams, who is a fellow in the International Security Program at the Center for Strategic and International Studies, or CSIS, and Deputy Director of the Missile Defense Project, where he specializes in missile defense and strategic forces, missile proliferation, and deterrence. He's also uh, the managing editor of the CSIS website called Missile Threat, which has a lot of useful information on it. And prior to joining CSIS, he was the Director of Advocacy at the Missile Defense Advocacy Alliance. With him is uh, Mr. Sean Sheikh, who is a Program Manager and Research Associate with the Missile Defense Project at CSIS, where he focuses on missile proliferation and Middle East security. Prior to joining CSIS, he worked at the U.S. Department of Defense and the Syria Institute. Uh, before the, these gentlemen begin, I will ask all the participants to look at the Q&A function on the probably right-hand panel of your WebEx, and in that window, you're able to type your questions as you think of them. Please feel free to uh, submit questions throughout the, um, throughout the proceedings. Um, please make them public to all panelists so that I can also see them. Uh, with that, I'll, I'll turn the floor over to Mr. Williams and Mr. Sheikh. Thank you very much, Melissa, and um, and thank you to uh, and uh, thank you to all who are taking part in this event today. And um, you know, I'd like to uh, sincerely thank FRS for organizing this this conference on on missile proliferation. Earlier this year, Sean uh, and I published a report on a one particular aspect of this problem, um, that being the use of ballistic and other kinds of missiles in, in the conflict in Yemen. Um, and as we started this research back in June of 2015, uh, when we noticed a, a news report uh, that Saudi Arabia had intercepted a ballistic missile fired from Yemen. And this was the first time we had seen a combat intercept of a ballistic missile since the early days of, um, since 2003, since the early days of the US invasion of Iraq. So it, um, it caught our attention, um, needless to say. Um, and you know, after March of 2015, you know, the use of missiles and missile defenses in, in the Yemen conflict would become a, a weekly, sometimes even daily occurrence uh, which we, on our part, did our best to track and chronicle over over the years. Um, the war in Yemen has seen um, by far, or has seen the most extensive use of ballistic missiles and other asymmetric aerial weapons of any conflict in in recent history. Um, we, we combined our research with other kinds of data gathered by other groups like the United Nations and the Yemen Data Project and conflict uh, armaments research, among others to try to piece together um, what has been going on in Yemen and what it means for the region. Um, the upshot being that uh, we believe the proliferation of missiles um, in Yemen has contributed to uh, a prolonging of the conflict 
and by extension has contributed um, to prolonging the, the suffering of the Yemeni people. Um, so uh, next slide, please. So first off, um, just a little background on the conflict itself. Um, the Houthi movement is a political and religious group that uh, has been a factor in Yemen politics uh, since the 1990s, but uh, the group had began to really become more powerful in 2004, um, and then in, you know, it capitalized and then capitalized on the upheaval of the Arab Spring in 2011. Uh, the Arab Spring in Yemen led to the resignation of Yemen's uh, then president, uh, Ali Abdullah Saleh, in 2012, who was replaced by the government of uh, Abdurraba uh, Mansur Hadi. And uh, after his ouster, Saleh aligned himself and his supporters with the Houthis, who then marched south and took over large amounts of, of territory. Um, in 2015, the Houthis took Sana'a, Yemen's capital, forcing out the Hadi government and prompting the intervention by Saudi Arabia and its coalition of partners to reinstate the, the Hadi government. And the sides have been locked in a, um, a military quagmire since, uh, with the Arab coalition controlling the air and sea, but unable to make much progress militarily on the ground. And as you can see here, these are the basic lines of control within the country, the light blue being the area controlled um, by, by the Houthi forces. Um, the Arab coalition launched its intervention in March 2015 with a, uh, an extensive air campaign. Part of that air campaign was aimed at eliminating uh, the Houthis inventory of ballistic missiles, uh, knowing that the threat they could potentially present. Uh, shortly after it started its air bombardment, the coalition announced that it believed it had destroyed most of the Houthi ballistic missile arsenal. In June, though, we start hearing about the first uh, Houthi missiles getting intercepted, um, and things continue to heat up from there. Um, the first major shock um, on this in this area came in September of 2015 when a Houthi ballistic missile um, hit a pro Hadi military base that killed around 60 people. Uh, another ballistic missile attack in December of 2015 killed around 100 coalition troops. Now, um, these early attacks all involved missiles that Yemen possessed prior to the conflict um, that were in control at one point of the Yemeni military. Um, these are weapons that we believe uh, survived the initial coalition campaign. They include things like the um, Soviet-built SS-21 Tochka missile, um, which is a, an older Soviet-built missile, which you can think of it as the, as the, the grandfather of the current Russian Iskander. Uh, we also see some, some Scud-type missiles, Scud-C type missiles, which we know at least some of which came to Yemen um, from North Korea in the early 2000s. Um, but we, we think the Tochkas, um, the SS-21s really define this early period of the conflict as they're, they're easily the most um, deadly ballistic missile that the Houthis have ever possessed, largely due to their, their uh, better accuracy than many of the other missiles that the Houthis have used. Um, both of the high casualty attacks that I mentioned in 2015 were, um, we believe, the result of, of the, the Tochka missiles. Um, you know, we know that, so we know that the Houthis had access to uh, government weapon stockpiles. Um, as highlighted in one UN report, the Yemeni military may have lost control of nearly 70% of its weapons around the start of the war. A later 2018 UN report found that uh, in early 2015, several missile, brigade, several missile brigades aligned themselves um, uh, with the combined Houthi Sali forces and we believe this is where um, the Houthis got a hold of uh, the Toshka and Scud missiles used in 2015. Uh, next slide, please. Now, as the conflict progresses, um, we see less frequent uses of these pre-war stockpiles as, as we believe they got started getting used up. Um, but then we see a growing appearance of, of new missiles that, Yemen, uh, that, did, that, that did not exist in Yemen prior to the conflict. Uh, the Houthis display these missiles, uh, give them names like Burkan, Kahar, Badr, um, and they claim these are domestically designed and produced. Um, in the case of the Kahar you see um, pictured here, these appear to be uh, surface-to-air missiles. Uh, 
um, Soviet built surface to air missiles that have been modified for land attack. And while the Badr is most likely an Ira uh, Iranian Fajr rocket, which Iran has proliferated um, over, over the Middle East fairly, fairly broadly. Um, other Badr variants we've seen uh, have simple guidance upgrades, such as fins, to, to improve their accuracy. Um, the Burkhan missiles are uh, the likely originate from Iran. Um, the United Nations came to this conclusion fairly early on um, that these missiles are coming from Iran, either in complete form or more likely in, in pieces and components and then assembled in Yemen. Uh, as soon as we see these Iranian sourced missiles, um, soon we see these missiles becoming longer ranged. Uh, the Burkhan 2H, for example, um, is uh, in effect a, uh, an Iranian Qiyam missile. We believe um, the Houthis use uh, the Houthis use these missiles to attack targets deeper and deeper into Saudi Arabia as the conflict progresses. Uh, this includes a series of attacks on Riyadh and the surrounding area, which got quite a bit of uh, media attention. Um, but despite you know these high-profile incidents of these um, you know long-range. Uh, missile attacks. You know, we see the day-to-day -day grind, as it were, in the in this um, you know missile war aspect of the conflict, to be really along the border areas, particularly around the southern cities of Kamis, Mushait, Najran, and, and Jizan, um, as well as inside of Yemen in places like Marib and and Mocha. Um, so now I'll I will turn it over to my colleague Sean Sheikh who will discuss what uh, what we believe is the strategy behind Houth the Houthi movement's use of, of ballistic missiles, their objectives, and how well this strategy has, uh, has served their cause. Over to you, Sean. Thanks, Ian. So we believe in the broadest sense that the Houthis' ultimate strate strategic goal is to stay in power in Yemen and bring an end to the coalition's intervention. To do so, we've seen the Houthis using missile attacks to raise the cost for Saudi Arabia to continue its intervention uh, in three basic ways. The first is to inflict military costs on the coalition, uh, disrupting aerial operations and killing their troops. Uh, the second is to negatively impact the Saudi economy by going after targets uh, like oil refineries, pipelines, and tankers. Uh, and third, we see the Houthis inflict political costs on the Saudis by targeting civilian areas in terror attacks, uh, attempting to get Saudi citizens to turn against the war. Um, we should also note that along with imposing these military, economic, and political costs on the coalition, we've also seen the Houthis use their missile arsenal as a source of domestic propaganda uh, to shore up local support. And uh, all that being said, though, we, we argue in our report that the Houthis have not been very successful at any of these goals, uh, save perhaps the domestic propaganda piece. So turning it over. Looking first at the military side, uh, out of hundreds of missile launches, we only found seven that resulted in major coalition casualties. And this is spread out over five years. Uh, so these uh, attacks, uh, successful attacks, have been very sporadic uh, and far too small to achieve meaningful military gains. Uh, the question then arises, why such poor results? We think there are two main reasons. First, a big chunk of these missiles simply miss and hit open deserts. And second, a lot of missiles have probably been intercepted by Saudi and UAE missile defenses. Uh, and on that latter point, we've seen evidence that Saudi Arabia and the UAE adjusted their missile defense posture to better counter Houthi attacks relatively early in the conflict. Moving to the economic piece, uh, here we have a sampling of attacks on economic infrastructure. And you'll notice that these are primarily targeting Saudi oil facilities and tankers. Several of these strikes have landed successfully, and even failed attacks have increased the perceived risk to production lines and vessels, potentially disrupting oil markets and raising shipping insurance costs. Uh, but again, as with the military piece, these attacks are far too sporadic, and the damage is often very light, if any. Uh, we've also found that Saudi Aramco has been able to, to quickly make repairs and get things back up and running. And now onto the political costs. Uh, the attacks into Saudi Arabia, and especially, as Ian had mentioned, those against Riyadh, um, have been uh, politically embarrassing um, and have raised pressure on Riyadh to end the conflict. Uh, these attacks have killed, wounded, and displaced hundreds of Saudi citizens. Um, however, 
Houthi missile attacks have in other ways really backfired. Uh, the targeting of civilian areas uh, has made the Houthis look like the aggressor. Uh, also by forming a bigger threat to Saudi Arabia, by acquiring these long range missiles like the Burkhan uh, and aligning themselves so strongly with Iran, it makes it harder for Saudi Arabia to accept a Yemen dominated by the Houthis. And uh, briefly looking at uh, internal Yemen politics, um, we find that since the start of the conflict, the Houthis have made their missile capabilities a centerpiece of public messaging and propaganda videos. Uh, the Houthis have frequently released videos of ballistic missile launches, often emphasizing new systems and capabilities. Uh, one video released in July 2018, for example, shows the launch of a ballistic missile from an underground erector launcher. And more recently, in February 2020, the Houthis released an actual music video with a, a compilation of surface-to-air missile launches. Now, the Arab coalition has, of course, attempted to mitigate the threat of ballistic missile attack. Their attempts can be broken down into three distinct parts. The first is the coalition's air campaign. Uh, the second is the maritime and air restrictions in place by the coalition. And third is the heavy use of air and uh, missile defenses. The first going to the air campaign, uh, this is perhaps the primary component of the Arab coalition's counter missile strategy, uh, targeting missiles and supporting infrastructure. This is especially true for the beginning of the conflict. Over the Arab coalition's opening uh, campaign, uh, their forces conducted over 2,400 sorties, dropping at least 1,000 bombs. This initial air campaign reduced the number of ballistic missiles on the battlefield, but still significant quantities uh, under Houthi control remained operational. And we see in this chart that the frequency of coalition airstrikes against Houthi missile targets left of launch, meaning before their launch, uh, that's declined significantly since 2016. Uh, there are two likely explanations for this decrease. The first is simply that the coalition targeted known missile launchers and depots at the start of the conflict. Uh, and of course, once destroyed, there were fewer targets for the coalition to strike. A second reason for this decrease uh, may be because Houthi missile forces have become more adept at evading detection from the air. And on that uh, latter point, uh, we find that the Houthis have developed uh, underground storage facilities to protect their forces and are conducting shoot and scoot operations to prevent counterattacks from destroying their launchers. Uh, and here we see uh, the vast territory from which the Houthis have conducted missile launches. Um, each of these points in red uh, is a coordinate provided by Saudi radar uh, to the UN. And here are key points we see from the air campaign uh, that namely left of launch was mostly useful and possible at the start of the conflict, that aerial strikes on missile forces have declined. Uh, and as just mentioned, that Houthi missile forces have likely become more capable of evading detection. So in addition to the air campaign, another counter missile strategy has been to restrict the overseas flow of weapons into Yemen. The coalition has done this, or uh, attempted at least to do this, through maritime and air restrictions and interdictions. Uh, Saudis have also established land-based border patrols, but there's uh, less reporting on this policy. So starting with the naval element, there have been at least seven maritime interdictions. I think most recently there was actually an eighth, um, and these have seized weapons flowing into, into Yemen. Um, while these seizures have included assault rifles, uh, anti-tank munitions and cruise missiles, among other supplies, we actually haven't found ballistic missiles or ballistic missile parts to date. Um, but still, interdictions of weapons shipments at sea have uh, provided substantial evidence of Iran's direct military aid to the Houthi movement. And similarly, here's a graphic of weapons seized over land. Um, the Houthi coalition has also established an air blockade over Yemen um, since 2015 to cut off the Houthis from outside support, uh, and all flights to and from areas controlled by the Houthis uh, require clearance uh, by the Saudi Ministry of Defense. As for the key points here, these maritime and air restrictions have been unable to consistently stem the flow of missiles and other weapons to Houthi forces. It's hard to measure their exact impact on countering missile proliferation, but unfortunately what we can say uh, is the severe impact that these restrictions have had on the humanitarian crisis in Yemen, 
cutting off food, medicine, and energy supplies. The last way the Arab coalition has countered Houthi ballistic missiles has been through the extensive use of air and missile defenses. Uh, from our own data collection, we found um, over here uh, that between March and 2015 and April 2020, um, Defense forces reported more than 162 intercepts of Houthi ballistic missiles. Uh, and as Ian had mentioned earlier, this total represents the largest use of ballistic missile defenses uh, of any conflict in history. And based on uh, reported intercepts, this map shows approximately where Saudi patriots are located and how much territory they cover. And Ian, uh, back to you. <clears throat> Thank you, Sean. Uh, so, so looking at some of the conclusions uh, about what all this means for Yemen and the region, um, you know, the Houthis' access to missiles of, of, the, of various types have, uh, we think, have allowed the Houthi movement to resist the Arab coalition um, and, uh, and pro-Hadi forces, but not defeat it. Um, and the Houthis' use of long-range missiles have been uh, really the least effective element of their military campaign. We've actually found that um, much more effective has been their use of small arms, things like anti-tank missiles, um, in particular has enabled them to, to resist uh, co Arab coalition ground forces and, um, and, and be able to maintain control of their territory. Um, but nevertheless, even though Saudi Arabia largely has the long-range Houthi missile threat under control, um, through the various measures that we've seen, you know, the, the Houthis' um, have continued possession and regular use of them against locations in Saudi Arabia, you know, naturally gives Riyadh significant uh, anxiety. Um, also, the prospect of the Houthis acquiring even more sophisticated weaponry in the future um, makes it very hard for Saudi Arabia to accept uh, an empowered Houthi movement in Yemen. Um, all of this combined really represents an intolerable status quo for Riyadh. Therefore, the, the Houthi possession of long-range missiles makes it very hard um, uh, for, for Saudi Arabia to quit Yemen, the Yemen conflict, even if it wants to. Um, but within this kind of conundrum, you know, we see potentially a diplomatic opportunity. Um, you know, should the Houthi movement be willing to give up its longer-range missile capabilities, you know, this could go a long way in allaying Saudi insecurity, um, insecurities and uh, an increase Riyadh's willingness to accept a Houthi role in the Yemeni government, which could help uh, achieve a more durable ceasefire. Um, and for all the reasons we have discussed, you know, limiting its longer range ballistic missiles would, would really minimally affect its, uh, its military capabilities. And so from, from what we've seen in our research, they would have you know, relatively little to lose in this regard. Um, so I think um, you, uh, we'll leave it there, and uh, thank you for your time, and uh, look, and uh, thank you for the opportunity to uh, to speak with you today. Thank you very much, Mr. Williams, Mr. Sheikh. I really appreciate your remarks. It gives us a lot of context for the discussion that we're going to continue to have now with uh, Professor Sipke Egli. Um, pro Professor. Egli has uh, begun his career in 1991 when he joined Turkey's Undersecretariat for Defense Industries, where he eventually became Director for International Affairs. Between 2000 and 2015, he held senior executive positions in international consulting firms. And since 2015, he's been teaching international relations and international security courses at Izmir University of Economics, uh, where he has focused on the proliferation of weapons of mass destruction and their delivery means, uh, as well as air and missile defense, nuclear deterrence, air power, space security, international arms trade, and export controls. I'm going to allow uh, Professor Eagley to continue here, but I wanted to invite participants to continue to submit their questions using the Q&A function. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Melissa. Uh, to begin with, it's a real privilege for me to be with such a distinguished set of speakers, participants in the uh, same platform. Uh, on my part, I will try to present a brief 
more or less more technical overview of what we call uh, ballistic missiles. Now, on that account, the, the definition is not an easy task. Uh, HCOC is, of course, confined to primarily what we call ballistic missiles. What we mean by ballistic missiles are basically those weapons propelled with a rocket engine. This sets them apart uh, uh, from like cruise missiles, uh, which are air breathing. They could be steered during flight, which again differentiates them from unguided artillery rockets, which usually have shorter ranges. Now, they supposedly follow a ballistic trajectory. That's the traditional way of defining, whereas it has become uh, more and more inapplicable recently, because a lot of the newer uh, ballistic missiles are, in fact, maneuvering during their flight, so they are not necessarily following a ballistic trajectory. For those of you who would like to uh, dig deeper into that, there has been or there have been a number of interesting studies about the taxonomy of, of a ballistic missile as a concept. Uh, one of them is shown on the screen actually under the credits. So I can recommend taking a look because the task is becoming more and more difficult to define what we call ballistic missile versus cruise or other type of missiles. And uh, last but not least, I have taken a minimum range value, which was a little bit uh, arbitrary for the purposes of this presentation. I have taken 125 kilometer, which more or less corresponds with the range of ATACOM and the torch cars that uh, Mr. Uh, Williams has mentioned during his presentation. Now, with that definition, when we take a look to the current possessors of ballistic missiles on a uh, global scale, well, this was a tricky table, of course, all on the basis of uh, open source intelligence. Uh, what you see is more or less 34 uh, active uh, possessors of ballistic missiles. The different time frames indicate uh, the when they got their missiles or when they included uh, new missiles or at least more of the same type of missiles into their inventory. Now, what the list does not include is a half a dozen non-state actors in addition to those. And of course, I have to mention there were uh, almost a dozen countries that in the past uh, possessed ballistic missiles, but they no more have them. So that's quite a wide list, as you see, almost like one third of uh, states on this planet have ballistic missiles. So why such interest? What is the motivation behind it all? Well, to begin with, ballistic missiles, uh, tactically speaking or militarily speaking, are hard to find and destroy before they are fired, as uh, the, the wonderful report about Yemeni operation has already illustrated. And on top of it, once they are launched, because of a number of properties, uh, their performance characteristics, they are difficult to intercept. It is possible, of course, missile defenses is possible, but it's extremely costly, technologically demanding, and uh, they risk being constantly outpaced by a more advanced type of ballistic missiles. And for a lot of countries, ballistic missiles are alternatives to combat aircraft or manned air power, which is more difficult to acquire, uh, more costly to uh, run and operate. So ballistic missiles is, is becoming an alternative, um, an alternative way of uh, acquiring military power if you cannot afford or if you don't have the manpower and other capabilities for an air force. They play a number of other important roles. I mean, strategic equalizer, for a lot of countries, this has been used uh, in the past and also today uh, to, to keep foreign adversaries, militarily superior countries away to protect the regime and leadership and all that. And of course, in a lot of cases, we see some tit for tat type of arms races dynamics uh, encouraging certain countries to get them the propaganda value, arming of the proxies, the prestige and recognition factor, both for domestic and international consumption, they, those have already been mentioned as well as part of the uh, first presentation. Of course, ballistic missiles have got 
some downside, uh, downsides. I have only uh, taken a few of them here on the screen. There are several others. Uh, one main problem is low accuracy. Of course, this is changing very fast, but uh, traditionally what we have assumed was that uh, due to their low accuracy, they will have limited tactical and operational utility. Therefore, they are not the best type of military useful, militarily useful weapons. But this is changing fast. So that low accuracy, again, uh, made them uh, a, a outstanding delivery vehicles for weapons of mass destruction, which do not need that much accuracy after all. And of course, also on top of that, it's a pretty specialized type of technological uh, and military investment. And especially if you want to develop or assemble them locally, you have to invest in, in uh, particular technology uh, areas. And those technology areas and the, the components you would need are subject to very complex export and technology control arrangements on a global scale which is increasing your cost and, and also make it more difficult. Of course, those measures are being increasingly outpaced by the developments in the field that I will revisit in the upcoming slides. So uh, we see quite a few countries, how, how, I mean, when, when they are interested in ballistic missiles, well, quite a few of them develop them, produce them themselves. Uh, what you see on the screen, 17 countries, uh, well, some of them develop domestically produced domestically others are assembling them using uh, components parts or technology acquired elsewhere interesting enough what i have also uh, displayed on that uh, table is two non-state actors to have joined that league recently and on top of that interesting enough half of those countries that that are producing uh, ballistic missiles are also exporting them so there is there's a there is a supply and obviously there is a demand for them and three more countries are are trying to uh, join that league of uh, exporters more recently and for those countries who are trying to assemble or purchase off the shelf their ballistic missiles interesting enough we have a very complex global network uh, between states, among states, involving several states, like a, a ballistic missile NOAA starting its journey in former Soviet Union, ends up, it's, uh, uh, finds its way to North Korea, from there on to Iran and Syria. And Iran and Syria are exchanging uh, the technology, and they also provide them to other players, actors, some of which are uh, non-state actors. So uh, there has been a, a splendid uh, report recently to have come out of FRS. Uh, it was a couple of weeks ago. So those of you who want to find out more on that, I highly recommend you take a look. I will not go into details any further. So on uh, the next stage, what I have tried to do is, okay, we have all those uh, states possessing ballistic missiles. Uh, what about like how active those programs are? And I have tried the color code and what I am trying to illustrate here is the pink colored countries are the ones who have joined the club recently during the last 10 years basically and there are six of them. They either didn't have ballistic missiles before or at least they had, um, they had eliminated that capability but decided to reacquire. And then uh, the orange or yellow colored uh, boxes, the countries in those boxes, are the countries which are adding new types of ballistic missiles or investing very heavily in, in ballistic missile, what could be termed as ballistic missile capabilities at this very moment. So there is obviously a keen interest, there is a renewed interest in, in ballistic missiles during the last uh, 10 years. And how are we uh, going to explain that? What are the reasons behind? Well, in uh, my, one of my observations here is that uh, the, the main blame goes to technological progress. Uh, advances in a number of technology areas are enabling development and production of ballistic missiles, which are increasingly more accurate, 
more reliable, more survivable, and perhaps most importantly, more affordable, meaning cheaper. And uh, this uh, I am going to categorize under two main axes, this, this technological trend and its impact on the ballistic missile inventories. One of them is what I will call the tactical uh, axis, the shorter range, comparatively speaking, ballistic missiles, which are very accurate and they are quite useful as a new, uh, for a number of new battlefield applications. And in fact, it is not only uh, those countries who could not own and operate advanced air forces, but also those countries in control of uh, sophisticated air power capabilities have also been showing keen interest in ballistic missiles recently. US is included, Russia is, Israel is, South Korea, Turkey, those are countries that traditionally preferred manned aircraft over, over missiles. So they are also showing an interest. On top of it, what I would call maneuvering missiles or the second axis in this regard is, well, you remember we said ballistic missiles uh, follow a ballistic trajectory, which is predictable, which is no more the case. You have, uh, like under this whole group of hypersonic vehicles, for example, uh, you are using ballistic missile as a booster to uh, take a payload up to a certain altitude in the atmosphere. Then that booster releases an aerodynamic vehicle, which is not necessarily a warhead that we are accustomed to. And that, that vehicle can maneuver widely within the atmosphere using the lift of the uh, atmosphere or air. And on top of it, we have, it's not only the hypersonic vehicles, we have increasingly a whole new variety of ballistic missiles whose warheads or even the missile bodies themselves, like Iskandar, that could, that could maneuver widely uh, during, during their journey up to their uh, target. So why maneuvering is a complicating factor or an important factor? Because uh, first of all, it delays detection. It uh, makes the task of tracking such targets uh, more difficult and the impact point calculation becomes more problematic, which has a whole variety of crisis management and escalation complications at stake. And uh, perhaps even more importantly, the missile defenses, the task of intersecting them become a lot more complicated, if not impossible altogether. Now, the, the picture is indeed worrying the last 10 years or so. You have accelerating missile race, not only in the Middle East, but also East Asia now. And, and even in Europe, it is not unthinkable for the years ahead. And uh, together with those developments, unfortunately, we have seen uh, the elimination of the last remaining pieces of arms control arrangements that are applicable to ballistic missiles like INF. And, uh, and even more worryingly, perhaps, uh, we see more frequent use of ballistic missiles in conflicts. I have tried to uh, put a table here uh, or list uh, displaying when ballistic missiles were used since the years they were invented back in the Second World War. And what you see is the last two or three years, it has started becoming more systematic, almost almost uh, daily, if not uh, uh, almost weekly, if not daily. Okay, so I mean, there's a worrying trend there as well. I mean, they are uh, becoming weapons of choice more and more. So the problem is there. What are the alternatives we have at our disposal to cope with it or to contain the problem? Well, I mean, not an easy solution. There are a number of tracks or alternatives. Export and technology controls, yes, they definitely worked up to a certain extent to delay or at least increase the costs associated with ballistic missile acquisition. But their effectiveness has been becoming more and more questionable, if nothing else due to the democratization of information and knowledge uh, in, in recent years. And on top of it, they, they encompass a number of uh, dangerous double standards and hypocrisies. Why should certain states be restricted, whereas the others would have a right 
uh, to use, especially if the leadership, the type of leadership a country does have becomes uh, not a differentiating factor anymore. On top of it, missile defenses, of course, the second track, yes, they are helpful as the, the, the presentation by Mr. Scheich and Mr. Williams has very well demonstrated, but they are uh, prohibitively costly expensive for a lot of uh, countries and they risk setting off uh, the dynamics of vertical proliferation, meaning more missiles in order to overcome uh, missile defenses and also countermeasures, more advanced ballistic missiles to overcome defenses. Now, arms control, okay, I mean, uh, always helpful, always should be uh, stressed and worked towards, but more recently, the winds are not blowing in the direction of arms control, what we see on a global scale. And the motivations of various possessors of ballistic missiles are too strong nowadays, I would call. They will not be very willing and ready to uh, get rid of their ballistic missiles or put some uh, caps on them. Last Ali, and uh, last but not least, I should say, confidence building and transparency measures is another uh, track we have at our disposal, like the HCOC, which is the only universal uh, arrangement regulating ballistic missiles right now. Of course, it's a small and a, a modest uh, initiative, but uh, it may be quite helpful over time in building norms and, and hopefully some constraints and responsible behavior over the use of ballistic missiles in the future. So this concludes my uh, presentation. I will uh, take my presentation off the screen and pass the word back to Melissa. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Angley. I appreciate your comments. I think in particular, I'm interested in delving into some of the technical advancements and how they affect um, uh, arms races and indeed the Hague Code of Conduct itself. Um, but before we do that, um, I want to encourage more participants to submit their questions through the question and answer box on the right of your screen. And I also would like to introduce our next speaker. This is Dr. Tuti Erasto. She's currently a senior researcher at CIPRI in the Nuclear Disarmament Arms Control and Nonproliferation Program, where she focuses on nuclear disarmament and nonproliferation issues. Uh, previously, she worked for the Plowshares Fund in Washington, DC, the Harvard Kennedy School Belfer Center, as well as the here in Vienna at the Vienna Center for Disarmament and Nonproliferation. Um, I'll turn the floor over to her. Thank you, Larissa, and thank you for inviting me to speak here today. So my presentation is based on a forthcoming paper that I've written with my CIPRI colleague, Peter Beseman, and the paper is titled Managing Missile Threats in the Middle East and the paper seeks to contribute to the current discussion on missile proliferation, much of which focuses on the Middle East. And although the focus of this panel is on ballistic missiles, our paper also, and my, my presentation, deals with cruise missiles and missile defenses. And while missile proliferation is uh, not limited to the Middle East, uh, as Sitki's presentation highlighted, the region stands out not least based on the increasing frequency by which missiles have been used. Um, and missile use there is not just limited to regional actors, as extra-regional powers have also frequently employed missiles as part of their military operations in the region. And this can actually also seem to partly explain the the proliferation dynamics in the region, because uh, in addition to showcasing the effectiveness of guided missiles in modern warfare, uh, and thus increasing regional demand for similar weapons, such operations have enforced the need for robust deterrence capabilities by countries that view themselves as potential future targets of um, operations, for example, uh, like the ones we saw in Iraq and Libya. So the paper presents an overview of regional ar arsenals of ballistic and cruise missiles, as well as missile defenses. And it also considers what could be a 
done to address related threats. And the overview is not exhaustive, and my summary of it here is even less so. But I think it serves to highlight at least three things that might not always be obvious based on the current discussions. Uh, first, uh, missile range is uh, not the only measure determining their strategic significance. Uh, much attention is drawn to the range of ballistic missiles, but um, for example, the range of air-launched cruise missiles is always augmented by aircraft, and cruise missiles also tend to be more accurate. Second, several, missile, um, several Middle Eastern countries have strategically significant missile capabilities, so the problem of missile proliferation is not only limited to Iran, for example. And third, this is not a new problem, as the accumulation, accumulation of missile capabilities has taken place over a long period of time. And missiles were first introduced to the region by Israel, which developed them in the 1960s. And Israel is also the only country in the region possessing nuclear armed missiles with an estimated range of up to 4,000 kilometers. And this undeclared nuclear deterrent capability has long been viewed as a source of uh, regional insecurity by other Middle Eastern countries. Israel also has various types of conventional missiles. These include domestically produced air launched cruise missiles that have reportedly been used to attack Iran Iranian targets in Syria since 2018. Uh, and as for Iran, it has the region's largest missile arsenal built since the 1980s. And in addition to, exp to its experiences in the Iran-Iraq war, Iraq's, Iraq, Iran's focus on domestic missile production has been influenced by sanctions and lack of access to modern aircraft. And while Iran argues that its existing medium-range ballistic missiles are sufficient for regional deterrence, uh, the United States and some European countries have long suspected that it too could develop nuclear-armed uh, long-range missiles, possibly based on SLV, satellite launch vehicle technology. Uh, and Iran has also used its short-range ballistic missiles in attacks against non-state actors, notably um, the Islamic State in 2017 and more recently against U.S. forces in Iraq in January, retaliating the killing of Qasem Soleimani. And re Iran has reportedly also supplied missile technology to the Lebanese Hezbollah and the Houthi rebels in Yemen, and it's accused of the drone and cruise missile attack against Saudi Arabia that happened last year. And and like Israel, Saudi Arabia has advanced combat aircraft equipped with cruise missiles, including UK-supplied storm shadows that have been reportedly used against um, the Houthis during the military operation in Yemen. And Saudi Arabia also has a small arsenal of um, medium-range medium ballistic missiles supplied by China. And although Saudi Arabia relies heavily on uh, imports, it now also seems to be interested in uh, its own missile production, production capability. Uh, and the United Arab Emirates has acquired Black Shaheen air launch cruise missiles from France, um, as well as short range ballistic missiles from the United States. Um, and the country has reportedly used uh, at least short range um, cruise missiles against the Houthis. I mean, shorter range than the Black Shaheen. Um, and other developments um, to summarize include uh, uh, the air launch cruise missile sales by France to Qatar and Egypt and, and by the United States to Turkey. And Turkey has also produced its own um, short range ballistic missiles. Um, and in addition, Israel and most Arab uh, states of the Gulf have invested heavily uh, in missile defenses uh, in response to the actual or perceived threats from non-state actors and Iran. Um, paradoxically, this has contributed to offense defense armament dynamics as Iran seeks to ensure an ability to penetrate such defenses by further developing its missiles. 
So to summarize, missile proliferation in the Middle East is not new, but it has intensified in recent year, years, while the threshold for using missiles has lowered. So there is a clear need for international efforts to manage the related threats. Thus far, such efforts have focused um, largely on Iran's ballistic missile activities, with relatively little attention paid to other relevant developments, such as the use of cruise missiles in the region. However, any arms control approach focusing only on one actor or one type of a weapon is unlikely to get very far uh, if it ignores other relevant military capabilities and broader regional security dynamics. So this is why we argued for the need for a more comprehensive approach for dealing with this issue. And um, as the region doesn't easily render itself to cooperative arms control, our recommendations mainly focus on increasing transparency and scrutiny on conventional arms experts as well as CSBMs. So the first recommendation is to uh, increase transparency through relevant multilateral instruments. And those regional states that haven't already joined the HCOC uh, could do so uh, to increase tra transparency and also to report their missile holdings and imports to the UN Register of Conventional Arms. Uh, but here it should be noted that Iran alongside Egypt has long viewed the HCOC as discriminatory and Israel has likewise been reluctant to join and the League of Arab States, for its part, has criticized the UN Register for not covering WMD, weapons of mass destruction. Um, and although these positions might not change easily, there could still be room for considering broader participation, if, especially if relevant countries saw some benefits in increased transparency. And there is also room for improvement for extra-regional arms suppliers who often omit information on their missile-related transfers when reporting, reporting to the UN Register or to the Arms Trade Treaty. Uh, the second recommendation is to clarify international norms on missiles. Um, and like was highlighted earlier, there is no international treaty specific, specifically dedicated to regulating missiles. And while the MTCR has agreed on strict limitations on the export of WMD-capable missiles, there is no concept, consensus of, on what this means outside of the regime or on the definition of what's WMD-capable. And this can be seen to call for the need for more inclusive international discussion, possibly in the form of UN expert dialogue clarifying such definitions, as was recently suggested by the UN High Representative for Disarmament Affairs. Third, there is a need for a more in-depth discussion on how arms exports shape regional security. Uh, the Middle East is defined by military asymmetries to which uneven patterns of arms control and supply have contributed. And combined with political tensions, such asymmetries um, are conducive to action-reaction processes whereby attempts by one state to close perceived gaps in its military capabilities trigger a response by its adversaries. And Iran's missile activities can be seen to be a case in point here. Uh, so this is why arms expert, experts should be subjected to more critical scrutiny that takes into account these kinds of dynamics. And the EU countries are actually required under the EU common position on arms experts to consider uh, such in impacts on regional stability. And the ATT, the Arms, Control, uh, arms Trade Treaty, uh, could provide a framework for a broader international discussion on this topic. And although this recommendation is about um, arms experts in general, uh, it's linked with the previous one in the sense that greater transparency on missile transfers would facilitate relevant risk assessments. Fourth, it would be important to de-escalate the heightened tensions between Iran and the United States, which partly derive from disagreements over missiles. 
the erosion of the Iran nuclear deal or the JCPOA has hardly eased concerns about Iran's long-range missiles. The U.S. withdrawal from the JCPOA was partly justified in terms of such concerns. And yet the subsequent erosion of the JCPOA has only enforced concerns about uh, Iran's potential to develop nuclear-armed missiles. And arguably the best way to try to reverse these negative di dynamics uh, would be to restore the JCPOA. Um, and in addition to being a non-proliferation agreement, JCPOA was also a tool of bilateral conflict management between Iran and the United States. And from the, this perspective, it could also alleviate Iranian threat perceptions of the United States, which are a major driver behind its missile activities. Finally, there is a need to address the root causes of militarization uh, through regional CSPMs, uh, confidence and security building measures. Uh, one potential framework for missile-related CSBMs could be the efforts at establishing a zone free of weapons of mass destruction and their delivery vehicles in the region. Although Israel's policy of nuclear, nuclear ambiguity would prevent any far-reaching CSBMs in this framework, certain steps could be explored even without Israel or its full engagement. For example, a regional dialogue could focus on clarifying the role of um, missiles, the mil military role of missiles, uh, or on an agreement on pre-notification on missile and satellite launches. And in principle, missile-related or broader CSBMs could also be explored within some other kind of uh, diplomatic framework, potentially among the Gulf countries or between the United States and Iran, but this would of course require um, the kind of political will that currently seems to be lacking. So to quickly sum up, um, missiles have long been both a source and symptom of insecurity in the Middle East. And imposing restrictions on missile proliferation is necessary but likely insufficient if done without con consideration to the broader a regional con context defined by military asymmetries. And particularly when applied only to some actors alongside continued arms experts to others, restrictive measures run the risk of contributing to the demand side of the problem by exacerbating such asymmetries. And finally, greater transparency, responsible arms, con arms export policies and CSBMs could help to strengthen efforts to restrain both the further proliferation and use of missiles in the region. Thank you, Thank you very much, Dr. Erasto. I'm afraid I have not done a very good job as a moderator keeping us on time, but I will try to make up with uh, some excellent questions for us all. Um, the questions coming in have been very sparse from the participants, but as I look through the official titles of everyone in the audience, I. I think I know why. <laughs> so I'm going to take those uh, few questions we've received and combine them with a few of my own. Um, I hope you'll indulge me a little bit because I'm fascinated by the technological aspects of these issues. But um, uh, I thought I would start first by uh, touching on some of the themes brought up by Mr. Williams and Mr. Sheikh related to the role of non-state actors in missile proliferation and missile use. And this is obviously a real struggle for the Hague Code of Conduct. Uh, I wonder if you might expound a little bit on how you see non-state actors' roles in, in the movement and use of these weapons, and as well, uh, what, if anything, states can do uh, with uh, regard to these non-state actors? Right, it's a, it's a, great, it's a great question, Melissa, and it's a, it's, a real thorny, it's a real thorny problem. Obviously, you know, the the uh, you know non-state actors typically don't have you know large industrial bases to build or, or or research and development um things to produce these things on their own so they're they're really required uh really require some kind of um of, of external support some kind of state-sponsored um 
support. You know, the the big examples that we see are are is Iranian support of you know organizations like the Houthis and and um, and Hezbollah in particular. Um, you know, you and we've seen the results of that being you know a quite different. You know, the, we have a, a kind of a steady proliferation and a steady use by the Houthis. On the other hand, on the other hand, if you look at Hezbollah and we see um, this kind of build up and build up of of rocket and missile capabilities by Hezbollah to the point where they, you know, created almost their own, um, you know, it's uh, what did, um, there was a quote that uh, Sean and I uh, wrote something on Hezbollah's missile capabilities a while back and we found a great quote from somebody, I forget, but it was, you know, that Hezbollah is a, is a maybe Sean can ch chime in and remember, it's a non-state actor that's um, trained like an army and equipped like a state, you know, so in the, in that sense, they almost have their own because of this this you know slow buildup of, of weaponry. They have their own almost have their own kind of deterrence um, uh, bubble around them. It makes it very difficult and, and you know adds a lot to a lot of insecurities in, in in the region. So you know severing these connections. I think the only way you can really address this problem is to be able to sever the connections between the state that is supporting these non-state actors. Um, you know, from from their from their supplies. So, um, and that's a you know a question of of getting this you know getting these uh, states that support these groups like like Iran to um, you know to to cut off that aid and however you do that through you know we, we've seen in the case of Yemen that has, you know export controls and 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 uh, interdictions is is only so uh, effective and they can also in the case of Yemen have. Pretty bad effects on on the economies and and the humanitarian situations. So, um, you know, you know, looking for you know, looking forward in the region to you know perhaps a new U.S. administration, perhaps some kind of revival of the JCPOA. You know, having that issue addressed in any kind of negotiated um, arrangement, I think, would be probably the most would be would be important and and. Um, you know, the best way of dealing with it was to, you know, sever these links. Mr. Sheikh, did you want to add anything? I think uh, Ian's pretty much hit it. Um, I would just second what uh, Dr. Arasu had mentioned, though, also addressing some of the security dilemmas in the region more broadly. Um, of course, that will have an effect on further proliferation. Um, so uh, my second question focuses on emerging technology, as I warned you. Um, at this point, almost all missiles are nuclear capable. <laughs> um, there are far more energetic propellants than ever before. Uh, we've had huge advances in technology for casting solid fuel motors, um, maneuverable warheads, uh, boost glide vehicles, um, advancements in, in penetration aids and other countermeasures. Uh, what, what, is, what is possible within law to cope with these enormous um, changes in the technological landscape? And is there anywhere we can focus our attentions? I noticed quite a few of the panelists are also experts on space. And I would wonder if space commerce could be brought into the fold so that responsible developers of space commerce are aware of some of the dual use nature of their technologies. I wonder if I could start with Dr. Eagley. Uh, well, Melissa, how to deal with the problem? I have tried to address some of them, of course. I mean, it's not either one of them. It could be a combination of them all. Technologically, that's a real challenge. I mean, what you are pointing out, because uh, to begin with, uh, the, the dividing lines we have used in the past uh, are fast disappearing. Uh, and, and new types or new categories of weapons, you could treat them, or they could be all seen as, as the iterations of the same technologies and the same objectives and the same uh, weapon capability in this respect. Now, how we can tackle with that? I mean, missile defenses will sure become more difficult, challenging. It is already becoming. And uh, what I have tried to point out during my presentation, I think one of the challenges is in the past, 
there was this uh, psychological barrier uh, in front of the use of ballistic missiles in, in conflict. If you think of the world of 80s or 90s, terror weapons, weapons associated with WMD capabilities, the dictators or bad actors using them, whereas the good actors trying to protect themselves kind of perception has been first, uh, fast disappearing and it will continue to disappear because what we see more and more, uh, almost everybody has started using ballistic missiles and will start using them even more frequently in the future because they have, they are, they have started becoming an embedded part of their battlefield arsenal. And uh, this, this applies to tactical short range missiles on the one hand, this also applies to the strategic level, like Avant-Garde and DF-17 and a couple of other ones coming in. And those are new categories, much more capable missiles, and some of them uh, equipped with conventional warheads, which, which means they, they are more likely to be used in, in future conflicts. So the real challenge, of course, again, I don't have a ready answer for that. That's a $1 million question you are, you are asking, basically how to cope with that. Well, it's, it's probably a combination of all those efforts, but the motivations on the basis of technology and the battlefield motiva motivations of nations are probably too strong to defeat and expect a very quick uh, and, and effective solution at this stage. Thank you. I wonder if I can open it up to any of the other panelists who'd like to, to remark on this. Yeah, I'll just chime in, you know, something that, um, you know, in, in past, you know, a lot of the non-proliferation regimes have been focused on, you know, missiles as a, as a way of delivering nuclear weapons, you know, but as we've seen, um, you know, the guidance technologies and accuracy, you know, improving on a lot of countries, um, ballistic missiles, particularly, we look at Iran as a good example of this, we're seeing them able to do, um, you know, have effects with conventional missiles that, um, in which case they don't really need um, nuclear weapons necessarily in all in all situations. You know, we look at, for example, the, you know, for a long time, we looked at Iran as not having um, the missiles accurate enough to really, uh, to really suppress and, and attack military targets because they were simply too inaccurate. You know, they had, you had to fire so many in order to, to hit the targets you needed to hit, that it was uh, impractical. But, you know, we saw, for example, early this year, the um, uh, the Iranian uh, ballistic missile attack on Al-Assad Air Base in Iraq, um, you know, effectively suppressed a U.S. base for about six hours. I mean, you know, no, you know fortunately, nobody was killed, but, you know, if there was, that was a conflict, you know, and that, you know, that base probably would not have been able to conduct military operations for quite a long time. Um, so that's a big advancement and a big change. And I think that's why you're, you know, you're going to see countries embracing, um, you, know, the, you know, the ballistic missile problem is, is really becoming, I think, a conventional, a conventional problem. Yeah, I'd have to agree with you. Another phenomenon I'm seeing is the challenge that states have in discriminating between uh, conventional and nuclear warheads and, and how they will behave if they cannot tell the difference. Uh, Dr. Erasto, I feel like maybe you were on the verge of, of saying something. Uh, yeah, I tried. Thank you. Yeah, I guess to both of your questions, I would um, focus on the demand side of the problem like regarding uh, the non-state actors, if I can still comment on that. Uh, for example, in the Middle East, I think con conflict resolution in, I mean, easier said than done, but conflict resolution in Yemen or between Israel and, and Palestinians would, uh, I mean, address the root causes of, um, of why the non-state actors there see the need for, for missiles and, and other weapons. And, um, and about the emer emerging technologies, if I recall right, your question was that uh, how that contributes to nuclear capable missiles. And again, uh, if you focus, look at it from the demand side of the problem, I guess one way would be to avoid creating situations where countries feel the need to acquire nuclear deterrent, where they feel that uh, they have rightly or wrongly, they feel that that's the only way to defend themselves. 
and um, um, no, I lost my train of thought. Um, yeah, yeah. Regarding the, I mean, one of the questions mentioned the uh, the nuclear weapons prohibition, the ban treaty, the treaty on the prohibition of nuclear weapons. It might, might seem a bit disconnected from this discussion, but actually, when you think of it in the from the point of view of the demand side and and the fact that one of the drivers for uh, nuclear proliferation is also might also be prestige to the extent that that is true, then um, enforcing the norm against nuclear weapons could also help, like that treaty is trying to do. Okay. So I have a bit of a pointed question. I wanted to push back on... Melissa, sorry to interrupt. May I? I mean, I've, I've just remembered last part of your question. If, if you allow me one more minute, uh, can I do that? Or sure. are we too short on time? The space dimension, you ask. And here there's a danger too, because a lot of those what we call maneuvering missiles and hypersonics, we are going to depend more and more on space assets to track, uh, uh, not engage, hopefully, okay? And when this is going to happen, it's going to involve uh, assets in space, meaning uh, satellites in space in, in missile defense uh, uh, initiatives more and more. And this is going to expose those uh, satellites because those are like low Earth orbit, meaning more vulnerable to interference from Earth. And once you start messing up with, with uh, low Earth orbit satellites, I mean, where is it going to stop? What kind of ramifications, what kind of tit for tat type of uh, uh, retaliation cycles it could create in future conflicts. I think it's it's pretty big threat for space security that that development of hypersonics and maneuvering missiles and the, the attempts to defend against them. Uh, thank you, and and I my apologies for for intervention. Okay, so I think with only two minutes left, then I would really like to just quickly go through each of the panelists and ask them how we can best incentivize states to feel as though the Hague Code of Conduct is a good investment in their, in their participation. Um, I think we've already talked about some of the underlying asymmetries and some of the techni technological as asymmetries. So what are the best ways forward for states to feel that the Hague Code of Conduct is worth their trust and investment? Dr. Arasto, I see you leaning in. <laughs> yeah, I guess at, at least, I mean, they should see a clear benefit in joining. And of course, um, I mean, if they if they are interested in developing, again, I'm thinking about the Middle East, if they're interested in developing some kind of cooperative security um, structures there, then I think, I mean, transparency would be in line with that and joining the H code of Conduct also and and also seeing um, seeing that they wouldn't have anything to lose and even if they would have um, some um, um, like criticisms towards the uh, the instrument I mean being part of it they could also join the discussion and and yeah I guess that would be my response. Mr. Sheikh, do you have any remarks? Yeah, I mean, I would just say broadly, uh, sort of co-aligning it with any arms control treaty, um, you're increasing stability and, and uh, opportunity for diplomatic relations. You're decreasing uh, costs for preparing for war and decreasing the cost when if war does happen. So I think those principles apply for, for all these agreements. And you can say the same for the Hague Code of Conduct uh, for, for uh, missile proliferation as well. I have to agree. The only left of launch I like is the diplomatic one. Any other comments? Um, maybe, Melissa, if I may just say a few words. Uh, well, I think, first of all, it's a good opportunity for countries to demonstrate their commitment to international peace and security. Uh, second, uh, they also have the benefit of receiving information the transparency measures lead to information being shared. 
among the subscribing states, both in the annual declarations and the pre-launch notifications. It is a low cost investment. There are no assessed contributions by subscribing to the code. Um, the administrative burden is not very big to fill in the annual declarations, especially not for countries that do not have any um, ballistic missile or space programs. And it's also low threshold. It's a political commitment. So it doesn't need, for example, to go through complicated ratification procedures in national parliaments, which might be a barrier for some countries. Uh, so low cost, low threshold, information, and being able to demonstrate a commitment to international peace and security. Thank you so much. I'll turn it over to Mr. Coudier uh, to, to finish this up. Thank you, um, Melissa. I would like um, to conclude uh, this session um, by thanking uh, all our uh, uh, panelists. So, uh, Ambassador von Zeelen, Ambassador Lagner, um, Mr. Williams, uh, Mr. Sheikh, uh, Dr. Egili, Dr. Erasto, and uh, yourself, uh, Melissa. Thank you all, uh, as well uh, to uh, all the many numerous participants who joined us uh, for, uh, for this session. And uh, as well, uh, thanks to uh, our uh, organization and support team here at, uh, at FRS. I hope this is just the beginning, uh, the first, I would say, of a series, I hope not too long, but still, uh, of virtual online events uh, on uh, the Hague Code of Conduct and related topics so that we can carry on uh, the, the conversation in the, in the coming uh, weeks and, and months. With this, I will uh, wish you, wish everyone a very good, uh, a very good day and a very good afternoon, depending on your time zone. Thank you very much and goodbye.